presenting, Anne. Sure. Right. Um, well, first, uh, so I'm Jana Wilcox Levin. For those of you that I have not met, and there are some very familiar faces on this call and some new faces, which is always exciting. Um, and just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is, we are really excited about these um, Women United Connect events that bring together both um, current members and future members and give us all a chance to learn together and build community um, and remember, continue to remember and reflect on being something bigger than ourselves and continuing to learn and better ourselves. Um, so with that, I thank you all for being here and Amy, I will ask you to introduce our guest. Yes, of course. Thank you, Jenna. Um, as Jenna meant, as Jenna mentioned, one too many cups of coffee today. Better slow my roll. Um, we are really grateful to have everybody here today. And Anne, I am pleased to be able to introduce not only my friend but my business partner, um, or shall, shall I say, in the reverse, because the friendship is is like none other, um, Anne Nicholson. And so um, as an expert in HR, in people, in strategy, in training, basically, if you have a, a problem, she's got a solution and she's got the expertise to be able to, to bring you into some awareness and some knowledge. So she has carried our team through the past 20 years of success. And even within this current year, which so many of us know has been hard and challenging, she stands um, strong at the helm for our team and so many people in the Valley and beyond. So she's a family woman with an amazing husband, Sam, who is also very connected to our community, two fantastic grandchildren, and dozens and dozens of nieces and nephews, brothers and sisters that brought all of them to be. So she loves Michigan football, which I look past as an Ohio State fan, for those of you that were on last during the last call. Um, I look past that. We still find love for each other in our hearts. Um, she is an amazing, an amazing crafter, and her heart pours into our community in so many ways, sitting on many nonprofit boards and being involved from a volunteerism perspective in so many ways. Um, she is the um, good that she brings with her whole heart and most importantly as our United Way Vice Chair. So Anne is very well um, connected in our Women United group as well as United Way as a whole. So I am pleased to introduce you all to my friend and expert in the industry, Anne Nicholson. Wow, thank you, Amy. I, I just feel like I'm gonna have to like turn back flips here to, in order to like live up to that. It was I, uh, well deserved, Amy. Oh, be thank humble. you. You guys are. We're wonderful. also ready for the backflips if you're ready to do that. <laughs> hey, don't don't dare me. I'm pretty competitive. I'm going to share my screen here so you can have the the uh, benefit of being able to uh, refer to what I'm talking about as we go through this. And I want to also say, so many of your names and faces I recognize. It's so wonderful to see you. And I am looking forward to uh, in, in July, uh, when I take over as chair uh, of United Way, I'm looking forward to being more involved with Women United. So that being said, um, we know that women have an instinct to tell other people's story and to support other people. And so what today is about is really giving you permission and perhaps some tips, hints, and perhaps a few techniques to be able to continuously build your confidence and tell your story. Um, one of the things that I will tell you is that there are, there are, we all have peaks and valleys in our confidence. This last year has really pushed most of us to the point where we were really focused on basics. We were focused on basic needs. We were focused on things that we had to get done versus things that we would like to get done. So we're gonna anticipate that after Q1 into Q2 of next year, uh, that we will be able to start getting back to some semblance of normal. So Simmons Group has a drinking game. If somebody says new normal, pivot, or unprecedented, you um, have to take a shot. So I'm gonna avoid that so I don't get too drunk too quickly. So with that being said, um, as Amy mentioned, whoops, now I know this works, there we go. I am, uh, we, we like to introduce ourselves a little bit differently because this is much more fun than the bios. Um, I uh, consider myself a leader, not just in this industry, but also in this community. Um, I'm instinctively looking for success. 
I constantly remind people that every challenge can be solved as long as we're focusing on the solution, not the problem. Uh, we know all know people who tend to talk only about the problem, the problem, the problem, instead of offering solutions. And that's, that's definitely not me. Um, I donated a kidney to my mother. Um, it gave us an additional seven years of life with, uh, with her that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, that happens to be my grandson. And uh, boy, he's, he's three now. So you can tell all that picture is. I um, truly enjoy people. And I, I'm reminded constantly that kindness is not weakness. And in a world where we can be anything, you've all seen this, be kind. We could all use it. And then, as Amy mentioned, I, I do um, I, I have a tremendous amount of appreciation for what this community has afforded me. And so uh, my husband and I both are very involved in, in the community, in fact, with some of you. So when we talk about doing something different, we're actually talking about getting outside our comfort zone. And we've, we've actually expanded this definition specifically to talk about lifelong learning, but also to talk about what's been happening with all the change that we've happened in this last year. So a comfort zone by nature, we feel safe, we feel in control, there's lower risk, perhaps lower reward, but that is by nature the fact that we're comfortable, we have, um, we have limited opportunity for risk. The discomfort or fear zone is um, where we often start to question our self-confidence, they, it's very impacted by circumstances we can't control. And I, you know, I need both hands and both feet to count all of the circumstances that we couldn't control this year. And it's also affected by others' opinions of us, especially those people that we hold in esteem. Um, and then once we, we understand where we're at with that, we can often move ourselves or push ourselves to what's called the learning zone. We face our challenges. Um, we Sorry, I just saw that someone was in the waiting room, so I, I was distracted there for a second. We face our challenges. I just let them in. Um, we have the ability to problem solve more effectively as we're learning about new things and different perspectives. We acquire new skills and we extend our comfort zone. So the, the way to get out of the discomfort zone is to offer yourself the opportunity to learn. And it can be difficult because we, we lack that confidence. And then finally, when we get to the growth zone, it's, it's when we find and live our purpose. It's when we have the ability to focus more. It's easier for us to focus on things like strategy, longer term thoughts, and it allows us to set new goals and conquer our objectives. So I know that most of us have, have been keeping ourselves focused on some day to day, and that has been necessary. Now's the time to start looking further down the road to look for some new goals, conquering some new objectives. And they may be to maintain some of the things that I've learned during this lockdown, continue to stay connected with family, continue to, uh, my half day is no longer 12 hours. It's really a half day of four hours. Um, so I mentioned all of that because as we think about getting from the comfort zone to the growth zone, you go through all four of those zones and we are at different stages in different points, different, um, we all take different roles in life and we're at different um, stages in all the different roles in our life. So Amy introduced you to this uh, personal brand uh, model that we use. The perception of others, she talked to you about the exercise where go and talk to six people that you know and ask them, tell them that you're just identifying some uh, you've been given a task to work on your personal brand, and you ask them to, if you, if someone could use only three words to describe you, what would those three words be? And your only response is, thank you, not, oh, you don't know me very well, or I've got you fooled, or all the other automatic responses that we have. Um, and so from there, write all those down in, in today's world, we text them to ourselves. So hopefully you've done that, because who I think I am and what I do and say are the two we're going to spend some time on today. Um, so if you've got the perception of others, that's one element of personal brand. Who I think I am is very much impacted um, around our self-talk. When I have negative thoughts about myself, they actually reinforce themselves. And so we are going to encourage you and I'm put you into breakout rooms. Um, oh, ugh, do I have the ability to do that? Well, we'll see. Um, so in what, what, I'm, what we're going to ask you to do in a minute is think of a thought that you have that you know is negative about yourself. 
And what we'd ask you to do is come up with a new thought around that. So throughout this year, most of our, my earnings have changed significantly throughout the year. And that, while I never really thought I was money motivated, it does make a difference that I haven't been contributing the way I have in the past. So I'm telling you my negative thought because I want you to see how we shift it. Come up with the new thought and be aware of consciously swapping out the old for the new. So my new thought is we've kept everyone employed. Everyone on our team has been able to stay employed and paid. So that has, is my new thought. Whenever I start to feel that, you know, should I go get that um, pedicure because I'm not contributing to the family coffers, I, I, yes, I go get the pedicure. And I also th- say everyone else, we, we've kept everyone employed. We've kept everyone, it's short, it's sweet. It's not a really lengthy process. So if we have the ability to put people in breakout rooms, Um, What I'd like to do is put three people in each breakout room, Laurel. Is that possible? Yes. And I'm going to, it's, and luckily we have 21 participants. Oh, perfect. Seven breakout rooms. And Anne, how long would you like the breakout rooms? How much time do you want to give That's a great question. We're going to give you three minutes. So each of you has a minute, then we're going to close the breakout rooms, whether you're done or not. So all I want you to do is practice saying with conviction, with conviction. We kept everyone employed this year or whatever your your new thought is. So as we're going into the breakout rooms, think about that negative thought. Don't say that one out loud. In your breakout room, only say the new thought. Now, those of you that are in the room with, with the others, as they're speaking, you get to tell them if they said it with conviction. You get to tell them if they said it with confidence. And please, no sympathy votes. We are women helping women. If I didn't say it with conviction, I didn't say it with some energy, then call me on it until I say it that way. So three minutes and then you'll be brought back in. And if, can I get a thumbs up from anybody that's heard that if you got it? Okay, great. I don't know about anyone else, but I feel dizzy from that Disney ride. Just kidding. <laughs> um, Laurel, you're on mute if you're asking me any questions there. You're, on, you're now the host. Okay, great. Oh, sugar. Am I the host or the co-host? That's said make host and I selected host. It still shows you as the host. That's okay. Let's not worry about it. Let's no, just go back it, to the presentation. It, it, I'm getting a, a thing that says Amy is the host now. Do you see it now, Amy? Yep, just came up. Let me close the breakout room real quick. 47 seconds. Quick, entertain us. Uh, I, there's that backflip. Time for that backflip. Am I still sharing my screen? Can you are not. No. All right. Are you aware of people back? saying try, maybe, and might? Say it with conviction. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And we'll just do it for two minutes, Amy. Then there'll be a three minute countdown. Or okay. the third minute will be a countdown. Yep. Mm-hmm. 12 seconds. 10 seconds. <gasps> 10 seconds. Longest 12 seconds ever. <laughs> of my life. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Great. Great. Seven rooms. And it's probably going to put you in a room as well. That's fine. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Quick, quick. Got just like 20 seconds left. Amy, I'm going to share my screen again, okay? Yep. Do you want me to make you the host host? I know that's okay. Everybody's coming back. Two, one. Is everyone back? Yeah. So how did that just let's hear from a couple of people. How was that? How comfortable was that or uncomfortable? Anyone just unmute yourself and tell us. It felt fine. Felt good to say. Good. Felt good to say good. Who else? Our, our group was great. Uh, we were very open and sharing and very different. Yeah, it usually is very different. Anyone else? Was anyone uncomfortable uh, at all? Well, go ahead. It was um, initially uncomfortable and it, I mean, it kind of required you to think introspectively and identify some of your personal weaknesses. But actually, once we provided the information, I found out that a lot of what my group members stated resonated with me. So it was, yeah. it was very supportive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes it is the first time we do, well, the first time we do something is the most uncomfortable time. Keep practicing that every time you feel yourself thinking a negative thought, what is the new, what is the possible positive from that? It will actually, um, we call it stinking thinking, get rid of that stinking thinking and give yourself the opportunity to recognize how many things you are how many things that are positive in your world? So I want to give you just a brief history of time. And the reason I'm doing this is because there are highlights in each one of them, in each of my jobs that I, my observation is you would have the same type of pride about things that you have done in your past. And there's a difference between bragging and being proud. We all know a braggart. We all know someone who... Uh, you know, always has, always caught the biggest fish, always did better than you versus being proud of an accomplishment. So I worked for a national fast food chain um, even before I finished college. And while I was working for them full time, I finished my degree. So I'm really, it put me on the path of always being able to multitask, but also be a lifelong learner. I worked with a grocery store and convenience store chain. Of all my jobs, this is probably my least favorite. I loved all my jobs because I learned something at each of them. It was also where I first got my, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that, where I first got my union experience. So everything added 
uh, to my knowledge and my experience. In 1993, I, be, I started in training in human resources and gaming. I became a certified human resource manager, which I'm old enough. This is before PHR and SPHR. Um, so I got grandmothered in. I moved four times in five years. I, I have always been able to adapt very easily and very quickly. And from the company's perspective, I helped save their bacon a couple of times moving so moving so frequently. Each time I received a 20 to 25 percent increase in salary. So as I think, as you think about the things, where are you at in your career? That may not be possible for you now, but thinking about the young women that we talk to and mentor, ask them, are they, if, if they are ready to move forward leaps and bounds, it might mean a, a relocation. Um, I was the director of volunteer operations for the 2002 Olympic Winter Games in Salt Lake City. And the lesson that I learned there, it was, it, again, my least favorite job was the grocery store convenience store chain. At the Olympics, I learned to trust my gut. When I interviewed with my boss, I, I was a little uncomfortable with some of the things he said and did, but I thought, oh my gosh, it's the Olympics. And eventually, uh, the relationships that I, I created there allowed me to start my own company in 2000. I started my company with three two-year contracts with other functions at the Olympic Games. So in my world, each of those experiences, each of those jobs gave me experiences that allowed me to continue to build my, my, my knowledge bank. Um, I also completed Stanford's executive program, which was by far the hardest thing I've ever done my, for myself in a learning environment, but also one of the best things I've ever done for myself. I now have colleagues from my cohort all over the world that I still stay in touch with. In fact, one was in Las Vegas last weekend and I was able to see her. And to my earlier point, there are five, I'm on five nonprofit boards, all focused on women in education. So as you think about your history, what are the things that you're proud of? Because when you start thinking about the things that you're good at, it allows you to sit up a little bit taller and allows you to remember that you, that remind yourself of the same things you would remind your best friend of. If they were saying, well, I don't know about this or I don't know about that, you can do that for yourself. There are a lot of things working against us. I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not Pollyanna. I know there are a lot of things that work against us. Some pretty specific challenges are, and we're going to give you some strategies around them for the future. So risk taking and advocating for ourselves is not taught to women. We're taught to take care of others. We are taught to um, give credit away to other people when things are successful. So I'm going to encourage you to get out of your comfort zone and do that personally at first. Do something that has challenged you. Perhaps it's with the nonprofit board. I know you're all committed to Women United, but perhaps do something with Women United that you're not as comfortable with. Um, job descriptions are not written to focus on the they have not in the past been written to focus on the things that women are naturally good at. And Lately, everything I've been hearing is that empathy is what's been most important in this crisis here. That is something that women tend to be more naturally comfortable at and are more instinctively comfortable at. So look for transferable skills that are demonstrating the things that a lot of senior level job descriptions or upper level job descriptions have, which is what did you have authority over? The word power sometimes makes women cringe, but what did you have authority over? M millions of dollars in budget, thousands of interactions with customers or people. Um, what, is, what are some things that were, you were challenged by and you overcame? What did you have a high level of responsibility on? We also are often challenged when we are um, assertive. It is called ag aggressive when women are assertive typically. We get called bossy versus the boss or that other B word. And so my encouragement to you is to take some assertiveness training if you haven't already. Uh, women can't, anyone can be strong, confident, and kind at the same time. In summary, assertiveness training is, is can be incorporated but for sure, emotional intelligence is something that I would recommend everybody take a look at. If you've got extra time to read, um, even if like right now I'm, I'm for every business book I read, I'm reading two trash novels or two trash books because I just need my brain to shut down occasionally. So when you're talking about salary negotiation, women typically do not ask for what men ask for. Um, and that is one of the reasons why in 2020, women get paid 82 cents on the dollar for men in the exact same job. Now, there are a lot of movements out there 
to get pay equity, to get um, some other in diversity, inclusion, and equity programs that more and more companies are looking at. I would submit to you that that's there's going to be it's going to be some time before all that is infiltrated into our world. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we often dismiss our education, whether it's college education or it is life experience education, we often dismiss it. And it's interesting that we're only paid 82 cents on the dollar, yet we're more than half of the college graduates. So while I, I'm not saying college degrees are necessary, if you have one, it's okay to put it on there and talk about your grade point average or talk about how you transferred it into the jobs that you've had, because some of us are pretty well past our college education days. Whatever number you're thinking in salary, add 20%. Whatever the number is that you're thinking of, add 20%. Um, if you can, look it up. There are numerous available resources through the Department of Labor in most states. The, the federal government has uh, by region information. So there are reasonable, or, uh, reasonable resources available. Call Amy or I because we do this research all the time and we have resources available to us. One of the things that women often will say is, well, I would like whatever salary is reasonable. My suggestion to you is to shift that thinking to ask the question, what is the standard in your company for this position? If the standard is a 80 to $110,000 range, ask for 110. <laughs> what are they gonna do besides say no? Men typically, will apply for a job they feel they have 80% of the skill for and ask for 100% of the dollars, which is why I'm encouraging you, if the company publishes a range or they're willing to give you a range, ask for 100% of the dollars. Because women typically wait for, they, them, so they typically wait to feel as though they have 100% of the skill and then ask for what's reasonable. And that tends to be the bottom end of the range is what they're going to offer you if you ask for a reasonable salary. Don't be reasonable in this. Ask for the top. All they can do is come back and say, well, this is the number that we have available. And then you can decide if you want to do that. There are a lot of other things you can negotiate besides money. And when you have confidence that you are a good that you have had good experience and good knowledge, it's easier to start thinking outside the box, ask for additional time off, and actually take it, for goodness sake. Um, ask for a sign-on bonus. Sometimes organizations can't give you the $110,000 salary, but they can give you a $100,000 salary with a $10,000 add-on bonus, or sign-on bonus, excuse me primarily because there's a 30 to 35% benefits load. Most of you know this. $100,000 a year person is $135,000 cost to the organization. So ask for a sign-on bonus because that doesn't impact the longer term. Ask for a, a, a more senior title. Um, if you're doing a lateral transfer on title, ask for a senior director or a vice president or a senior vice president title. Ask for an increased bonus percentage. Um, relocation, if you're considering the relocation option. Um, ask for your car payment. Ask for a car stipend for to be able to get to and from work. Um, ask for a housing allowance, especially if you are relocating. Ask for a car service. Boy, if I didn't have to drive every day, not only would my stress level be lower, but I'd get a lot of work done on the phone. Concierge services such as uh, shopping services, laundry services, th these things are available to you. And and even if the current... the ugh, the company doesn't currently have these offerings, it may get them thinking, well, maybe we should be offering them if people are asking for them. Nanny services, if you have children at home. I have a friend who was the uh, primary breadwinner. In fact, she was a single parent when she did this. She relocated to Las Vegas as a senior executive in a gaming company and negotiated into her salary nanny services. Um, so, And without that, and the company realized the benefit, without that, she would have a lot more on her on her personal plate that would impact her being able to do the work. Um, development and be specific. Ask for $2,500 a quarter for your own personal development. That is not unreasonable at a director level. A senior level would be even more. At a management level, ask for that. See what you can get. That personal development will allow you to continue to, to build your own confidence. One of the challenges that we run into as you're thinking about doing new things is that there are some 
things, there, there are some emotions that we go through as we move through change. When something ends, the initial emotion is denial, where there's anger, fear, guilt, and blame. Um, and then we move into resistance. Wow, I lost my focus. I have wishful thinking. You know, even if it was a job I didn't like now that I've been laid off, it, it really, did I really not like it that much? Um, and we get to tend to be nostalgic about the past. We forget some of the things that were, that, that we dealt with every day that maybe weren't so great. Um, every, every big change is going to, it's actually Kubler-Ross's, um, this is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work on the stages of loss. And when you lose a job or when you lose something important in your life, a lot of us lost vacations and holidays this year. We go through all of these stages. Um, then we go into exploration, letting go, testing limits. We still have some anxiety and confusion, but we search for meaning. Uh, my family wasn't able to get together for Thanksgiving this year. We may, all made the decision that it just wasn't, it wasn't safe. There are 45 people at our Thanksgiving dinner table. And we all decided the search for meaning was we'd, we'd rather have many more Thanksgivings than to have this one. And then there's commitment where hope, enthusiasm, and integration begin to resolve or begin to appear. The, one of the challenges is that all of these things, you can be at different stages in all of these things with all the different losses or changes going, going on in your life. Things that impact our ability to move through those stages are timing. And if I think about this year, we had social unrest, political divisiveness. Boy, is that a kind word for what we had in our political world this year. The global pandemic, in addition to all of the things that happened that we had no control over, um, what was the cause of the change may not have been d d uh, directed by us. What was our investment in the situation? What are our current resources? And if you look up at these first three, social unrest, political divisiveness, and the global pandemic, a lot of our resources weren't available to us. How more, much more emotional we felt, our physical well-being, if we were sick or we knew someone that was, that was sick, our financial status may have changed or adjusted. And, and our support group, while we may have been able to see them virtually, we often couldn't get together and get a, a hug. And we are hardwired. We are absolutely hardwired to connect with each other. So as you think about all the things that have impacted us, one of the things that we know have happened, and, and this, there's a whole new field of study on change fatigue, um, it's the loss of focus, energy, and willingness in leaders and employees constantly impacted by organizational change. You can apply this to your family also. If you, instead of leaders and employees, it's family members constantly impacted by family change. So all of this is creating an environment where we are struggling to get to get past it. I, I typically am very good with change. And I found myself on, on this emotional roller coaster that I'm just not used to having. So being able to know that in your organizations, in your families, there's more noise when there's change fatigue. There's more frequent and louder complaints about change, even if people hadn't had challenges before with change. There's some apathy. There might be some apathy in your family. I had a couple of siblings who were just very frustrated that we weren't all willing to risk, in many cases, flights or being in a room with 45 people that were not, and that's out of nine households. Um, so being, um, making sure that you are being respectful and giving people grace when they have an opinion that may be different than yours, but you also we find ourselves stop asking, we stop asking questions when we have just given up. So start asking questions again. People are visibly tired. People are feeling anxious about change. Um, I don't remember who I told. My husband decided that he would use the Thanksgiving weekend because we were in town to rearrange my, in, or to give me an entirely new setup with technology in my home office, which is where I'm working out of right now. I'm not sure if that's grounds for divorce, but I think I could probably make the case that it is. My biggest challenges with change come with technology. He knows this about me, and I, I was not particularly happy. He, he had the best of intentions. He had time on his hands, and he wanted to feel as though he was adding value to my world, and all he did was really create craziness for me. And it's been a couple weeks now. I'm getting used to it. Um, there's some resistance when there's change fatigue, more resistance perhaps than we've seen in the past. Um, more energy, while sometimes 
sorry, there will be pushing back on change with more energy while sometimes you don't resist at all. And that is also a combination of resistance and apathy, depending on how the change impacts me. There's some cynicism. Um, you know, the, the origination of the word sarcasm is to tear flesh. I had to rethink my whole sense of humor when I learned that. So keep in mind that, that there is a way to present something if you're unhappy that doesn't have to rely on sarcasm. And then skepticism. People will express doubt about the ability to, to be successful with change. And startling, startlingly or sadly, 71% of all organizational change fails. I don't know what the number is for 2020 because I can't even imagine how much change people have had to go through. I would imagine that it dropped. It's no longer 71% because we've all had to change. Um, but I, it, it definitely can be difficult when, when we're all so tired. So what are some things that you can do? Acknowledge the change, assess the need really for another change, the timing of it. Um, Amy mentioned to some of you who are on the call that we, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm not sure anyone was on the call, we were talking beforehand that um, we typically have this great holiday tradition that we're not gonna be able to do this year. So we're gonna have celebrating all the holidays that we missed in 2020 sometime in March. Um, evaluate your level of control. What are the things that you can control versus what you can't control? Check your own BS and that's belief systems for those of you who can't see my screen. What am I, how am I reacting? What am I saying and doing? I, I ask people for grace, but was I giving them grace when things were challenging for them? Um, be in the present. It's hard to put all that other stuff aside, but being able to think about who or what is in front of you right now can be very, uh, can relieve some stress. Um, face your fears and feelings, knowing that you're going to have to go through that fear zone to get to the learning zone, to get to the comfort or to get to the growth zone. Um, be part of the change. If you're asking everyone to change and then you're not changing, that can be a big challenge also. Keep a regular schedule or, or, and structure as much as possible. I, I can't tell you how much this impacts children. Those of you that have children or that if you're homeschooling, it also makes a difference for you. Um, I, I still get a pedicure. I may not get them quite as often, but I still get him. Um, I, I have started to work out twice a week. That has been not only a gift to me from a health standpoint, but also I can no longer have the excuse that I don't have the time. Um, so that structure, I look forward to that structure. Write down the positives from the change. I can list a number of things that have been very positive for me in this change, even though the change has been horrible and nothing that I would have wished on anyone. Um, I, can, I can list a number of things that have been positive. Get some sleep. Um, those of you who say that four or five hours is enough, I promise you, you are shortening your lifespan. Give yourself the opportunity to get some sleep. This all comes from the psychology of dealing with change, how to become resilient. Um, and you're all welcome to this uh, PowerPoint presentation. I know this entire video is going to be, uh, this. everything is being recorded, but I will also send this PowerPoint presentation to Riley to send out to everyone who's on the call. So you don't have to listen to me yabber at you <laughs> in order to um, get all the slides. I am not sure if someone is chatting. Am I missing chats? Ah. You're good. Okay, just, great. Stacey, Thanks, Amy. Yep. Stacy was just saying she loves getting her eight hours. Me too. I'm an eight hour girl. So what you can do, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I will tell you that my favorite F word is flexibility. And I've said that for years. I've said it for probably 30 years. Um, I have, I have found my limits in the last nine months. I have definitely found my um, edge. And so knowing that, that usually it's around technology, just so you know. Um, so reminding myself that I can be flexible and I can adapt. Create scenarios and checklists. The what if scenarios, at least if you get them down on paper, your brain stops whirling through them at night when you're trying to sleep. Um, identify the impact. What are some alternate scenarios? Articulate what success looks like for you and measurements along the way so that you can give yourself the congratulations of moving forward. We were getting a lot of this through other people, whether it was clients or coworkers or bosses. It's much more difficult to do that now. 
overestimate bandwidth and time needed for the expected change. Uh, all of us overachievers thinks, think we should be able to do this instantly. Give yourself time and allow for additional time. Be kind to yourself. I mentioned uh, in a world where you can be, ever, be anything, be kind, including to yourself. Um, be the, what is the, uh, perfection is the killer of excellence. So recognize that you may be able to have something be really good and not be perfect. We always recommend reading. Um, I, again, you'll get this, you'll get these picture or this, uh, these books. We have an entire reading list. Um, Switch is about emotional intelligence. The subtitle is how to change when, how to change things when change is hard. The Confidence Code by Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman is about specifically about women. There's also a confidence code for teenagers. If you have a teenage daughter, highly recommend it. Read it with her. Um, have conversations about it. We can send you our entire uh, reading list. And again, these, these books, this slide will come to you in the slide presentation. So what matters most is how you see yourself. And when you think about confidence, we think, oftentimes we think that I either have it or I don't. So I'm going to have you all do something. Whatever, unless you're driving, if you're driving, don't, don't do this. And wherever you're at, sit up straight with your shoulders back and your head up and smile and say, I feel awful. Now, come on, smile and say it. Say it with some conviction. I feel awful. Doesn't work, does it? I can only see a few of you, but you look pretty funny. Now I want you to hunch your shoulders over, hang your head, take a deep breath, frown and say, I feel great. That doesn't work either, does it? If you simply change your physiology, sit up straight, and it's hard when you're on Zoom. I actually have this adjustable thing now where I can stand my computer up so I can stand up. Um, if you fake it till you make it, you will actually be able to have a more, you'll feel better. It's not going to eliminate your problems, but you will feel better. So as you think about your day, as you think about the people that you interact with, you have a choice every day. Be responsible for the energy that you bring. And for those of you who are, are not familiar with um, Amy Cuddy's power poses, do the superwoman, or sorry, I'll stand up. Do the Wonder Woman pose and put your arms up above your head. That was probably not the best view of me, um, but you can actually change your energy. Um, this is how I choose to show up every day. For those of you who have never seen this picture, I, I have it laminated in my wallet. That is not actually me, but I like to think that when people see me, that's how they feel. Um, how positive are you? And, and I'm not suggesting that you be unrealistic or that you be Pollyanna. Hard things are happening right now. Understand and, un understanding that and giving grace to yourself and to others is very helpful. One of the things that we know for sure that impacts our ability to be positive is how many judgments we make in a day. So I have been working on this for 37 years. Well, I'm going to say even longer than that, probably 40 years I've been working on it. And my suggestion is that you keep in mind that if I can stay in question, I tend to be less judgmental. And so I, I'm going to tell you a really quick story, and then I'm going to wrap this up for questions. Um, I was flying somewhere. This was last year. I was flying somewhere. I, by the way, I do not like lines in general, but I really hate TSA lines because I don't think it makes us any safer. So I'm really thankful that we've got the pre-approved, you know, okay, I'm going to, that, that's just the best thing ever. I had to change a flight. And while it all worked out, it was still it screwed up my day because I had to get to the airport sooner. And, and so I was already a little bit anxious about the, um, about the flights because it was a multi-city. I was, I was on the Springsteen tour. I was doing five cities in five days. It was crazy. So I get to the airport. I'm already a little tense because I, you know, now I've got to remember what airline I'm on and how I'm getting where, and I got to make this connection in Salt Lake city. And I get to the TSA line and I hand him my driver's license and when we're in a halted state, hurt or hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we tend to have less, um, re we have fewer resources available to us for coping skills. So I was pretty, pretty hangry at that point. I get to the TSA, I hand him my ID. He said, ma'am, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to accept this ID. 
Now, instantly, I lost all of my logic, all of my very skillful things that I teach other people, except because I've been practicing this for 40 years, I asked him a question. I said, Why, whatever is wrong with that ID, sir? In my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, is it expired? Did I do something wrong? Did I give him? He said, well, I clearly it's a fake ID. So my question back was, because in my head, I'm thinking I haven't had a fake ID since I was 16. In my head, what I said to him was, what about my ID makes you think it's fake? Again, being able to stay in question is very helpful to, helpful to spend judgment. Now, by this time, the line is backing up. What about my ID makes you think it's fake? He said, you cannot possibly be this old. I, he made my day. He made the day of everyone around me. And I can tell you that in my past, prior to getting comfortable about suspending my judgment by asking questions, I would have gone, you know, my taxes pay your salary. What's your problem? I've used this idea. I had all kinds of great come. And instead, I ended up being much more calm. Everybody around me, everybody around us who heard it thought it was hilarious. And I said, well, actually, it's, it's not. I'm really only 12. So being able to suspend your judgment can be very impactful on you to stay more positive and how much you encourage those around you. It's instinctive for women to encourage other people around them. Give yourself that same benefit. So with that, I probably went a little long. I apologize. I'm going to um, open it up for questions. And I'm going to clear this out so I can see you. There we go. Hi, Roy. Anybody have any questions? Um, this isn't more, this isn't a question, but more of a comment. Like, thank you for giving so much to chew on. Um, and you're welcome, Jean. Thank you. Hopefully it's helpful. Actually, actually, I do have a comment. Um, this is a wonderful presentation. And, and um, while you're talking, it occurred to me that many men need to hear this, specifically um, minority men. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good they, point, right? They find themselves in the same boat as professional women, believe it or not. Absolutely just, true. Just food for thought. And Thank I'm you. happy to present to anybody that I, it's all, I believe the more people that understand this in our world, the better our world is. So happy to present to any group. That's a great point, Roy. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question about how do you find out what your actual standard pay range is for your job in your organization? You know, if there's like 15 other people that do your same job. That's a great question. Is that Krista that asked that it question? Is. Okay. Yeah. So there are two things you can do. Um, as of right now, um, the, and I'm going to get it wrong. Is it led Lily, the Lily led better act? Is that the, Amy, can you check me on that? There is, uh, there is some legislature at the federal level around pay equity, but it's not uh, there. Not every state has implemented a pay equity system. Oh. So um, one thing that you can do is ask your HR um, department. Um, you just want to see where you fall in the range to see how much opportunity you have for growth. Um, usually they'll share your own salary range with you. Um, if they refuse to call Amy or I, we'll give you some pretty specific language to get to that. <laughs> okay. But also, but also you can go to, um, I, and forgive me, whatever your industry is, the Department of Labor in your state um, has some guidelines. Uh, you, there are also industry uh, wage surveys that are available, as well as the Department of Labor Dot gov dol.gov is the department of labor labor at the federal level they have regional and state by state information so um, if you want to find in your organization your hr department's going to be the best way to go and theoretically if it's your category your grade your whatever they call it your band they should share that with you thank you you're welcome and just, I mean, I'll reiterate just real quick that not every organization has that information to even give you. Some organizations don't 
do a compensation philosophy that's that sophisticated. And that could be because of size, could be because of industry. There could be a lot of yeah. pieces and parts that make that up. So another reasonable question, if they say we don't do it that way, then can you just please look at everybody who has my same job title? I'm not asking for their names. Can you please look at everybody that has my same job title and give me that range? The lowest paid and the highest paid is all I'm asking for. Um, they may say no, because in that case, it could be considered confidential information, mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly a, a way to ask. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. So again, this presentation will be available. To, it, it'll be sent to you. Anybody who's on the call, it'll be sent to you. And uh, you also will have, I believe, access to the um, to this entire spiel. So thank you all for your time today. I'm handing it back to Laurel, I believe, right? Thank you, Anne. And thank you so I'm, much, Anne. Yes. Well, I'm excited to share with, with the group that uh, the January uh, Women Uniting Women United Connecting with Conversations is going to be led by one of our Women United members, Wendy Pressler. And uh, if, if you have a specific topic that you would like her to speak on, she's a leadership coach, executive coach that uh, works here in both Nevada and outside of the state. So uh, if any of you have any topics of conversation you would like her to address, just email those to me at United Way and we will give those to Wendy and we can see what she decides to present next month. Wendy, do you have anything else you'd like to ask the group? No, I think that covers it. Thanks, Laurel. I'm open to whatever will support the women. So let me know what you'd like to hear. All right, everyone. Well, we, we hope you're enjoying our monthly uh, connecting with conversations. We are continuing with the schedule of the third Tuesday of each month from noon to one. So stay tuned for um, information about next month. We wish you all the best this holiday season. Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas. And I think we can all agree positive thoughts for a healthy, happy, kind 2021. Thank you, Anne. You're welcome. Have a great one. Bye. Bye.